So So so this is that yeah yeah let's start this okay it's significant more than the paper to have it's it's so good yeah it's just like okay so you can if i forget so when i when i start with the argument with you got to so then okay then for that okay and then when i see the project project then start to get then you will start to go so all right sorry for this one so this part you i should just press yeah this when you get here yeah. i would like to briefly yeah. okay. okay i think i got it not too, not too difficult <laughs> Did you get the chair today? It's a, yes, I think I'm uh, I'm the official slide presser, <laughs> slides shifter. I guess that can be my title. <laughs> Do you have slides there? No, I was going to talk off the top. Oh, okay. <laughs> I've got so many PowerPoints. Yeah, yeah. I said another PowerPoint. Good. Good. I'll talk slowly. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. I think most people here are probably studying in English normally. Right? <laughs> Perhaps I know a few of them. <laughs> so after years of doing talks like this, do you uh, feel very comfortable beforehand, or do you get? Oh no, I don't okay. get too nervous. No, but okay. <laughs> this group, I feel I know many of the people. Yeah. So it's, and it's a little low key. I even had something with a few people I met just. Hey, who were they? <laughs> okay. I'm so glad to find a place. <laughs> I couldn't believe they lived down in my sky. It's such a hard place to find for natives. <laughs> Do you get nervous when you do like big talks or you get pretty? Oh, it's significant. More than 50 people, yeah, I'm sorry. Oh. Like that. Okay. Check. Okay, so Bismillah rahman rahim So I think we should start. Respected guests, uh, Dr. Wahiduddin Sheikh, uh, Dr. Elif Tokai, uh, Professor Wahbi Waisan, Professor Maryam Cook, and uh, Professor and Speaker Bruce B. Lawrence, uh, colleagues and fellow researchers who have joined this seminar physically and virtually. Merhaba, namaste, salam alaikum, welcome, ahlan wa salam, rojbas. We have here today uh, many distinguished professors, so I'm a bit nervous, excited, and also delighted to host this seminar. My name is Rajiv Kumar, and I am from India. Uh, and a PhD student at Alliance of Civilization Institute, Ibn Hal University, and also a coordinator for this seminar. To begin with this seminar, I would like to express my gratitude to Professor Bruce B. Lawrence and Professor Miriam Cook for accepting our invitation. And then I would like to thank the Alliance of Civilization Institute, Ibn Hal University, and Theology and English faculties of Istanbul University for collaborating and providing logistic support. My special thanks to Dr. Sumaya Parlidar for her immense interest and support for this seminar, and also to Dr. Yaqub Ahmed. I would like to briefly introduce Umran Academic Research Association, or UARA. The UARA 
is an academic project of Umran Green Perspective Foundation or UGPF, a registered organization in India founded by Rajiv Kumar. It promotes social communication and inspires humanity for peace and prosperity. It draws inspiration from the Bauhaus movement of Walter Gropius, Ibn Khaldun's Ilm al Umran, and Bruce B. Lawrence's Barjak Logic, which expresses Indic spirit Vasudheva Kutumkam, the whole world is one family. Umran Green Perspective Foundation involves a unique educational approach that empowers women and underprivileged children, brings both advantaged and disadvantaged people together and develops environmental consciousness in society. The Umran Green Perspective Foundation has initiated four significant projects. The first SLY library in Bihar, India to empower education in marginalized community. The second Umran Green School of Languages, which teaches 14 languages from basic to advanced. The third project that we have that is organizing the seminar, Umran Academic Research Association. On the Barjak, it works on the Barjak logic of uh, which has been newly introduced by Professor Bruce Lawrence. And it works to advance and implement a new approach to Islam, Irfan, and various disciplines such as history, social science, and philosophy. Umran Women's Magazine is the fourth project which is yet in process of taking shape. It will focus on the woman's voice, imagination, and representation in various forms. We are conducting this seminar on Bruce B. Lawrence's most recent book, Islamicate Cosmopolitan Spirit. Uh, at a time when understanding Islam as a religion needs to be discussed among both Muslims and non-Muslims. As we know that the religion plays a significant role in society, but when we talk about India, religious studies are sidelined from academic institutions, but they are hotly debated in public for social and political interest. As a result, religion and religious understandings have become more limited in scope and spirit. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, has more than just a, uh, was, a more than, was more than just a Muslim. He was also cosmopolitan in nature and character, which enabled him Your voice is and no, my voice is not coming. Islamicate cosmopolitan spirit. Islamicate cosmopolitan spirit is not restricted to Islam, but also expresses the Indic spirit Vasudhev Kutumkam. The whole world is one family and technological advancement in the West. Prof Professor Bruce B. Lawrence says the Islamicate cosmopolitan, uh, cosmopolitans have had a distinctive impact across the Af afro erosian ecumene at the center of civilized contact between competing yet convergent interests. Thus, the Islamicate cosmopolitan spirit defies East and West binaries, incorporates components of humanity's collective past, and pursue other a moral existence that is both aesthetic and agnostic, individual and collective. The book introduces the concept of Barjak logic as a new methodology for studying Islamic history in a broader context of world history. Professor Bruce B. Lawrence need no int uh, introduction, but yet I will give a brief. Bruce Bennett Lawrence is the Nancy and Jeffrey Marcus Family Distinguished Professor Emeritus of Religion at Duke University and Adjunct Professor of the Alliance of Civilized Institute at Ibn Khaldun University in Istanbul. His research focuses on contemporary Islam as a religious ideology, South Asian Sufism, and Islamicate cosmopolitan or Muslim network. 
he has authored and co-authored many articles and um, books. So without any further ado, um, I would like to invite Professor Bruce W. Lawrence. Welcome, Professor. Well, thank you, Rajiv. Thank you for that introduction, but thank you also for all the labor of bringing together these people and providing this venue for Professor Miriam and me to be able to share their thoughts with, um, with many of you. I recognize many faces. There's other people whom I don't know, but I'm happy to be back here in this space, which uh, feels more like a classroom than almost any place I know. It, it has a kind of openness and uh, Although it was much harder, I must say, to find it today after two and a half years because of COVID not being here, Miriam, my wife, who's with me and will speak also briefly, we both said, maybe it's gone away. Maybe we just have forgotten where we were when we used to teach here because we walked through the Sudamani and we walked down and we saw all the work going on. But then we saw the doorway open and we said, ah, it's still here. So I can tell you, it's very ha I'm very happy to have the invitation to come I'm even happier to find the place. Uh, I have much to say about this book and the book is a self reflection of probably my whole life at least as an academic. But I, I felt it when I talked about this that instead of immediately discussing Islamicate or cosmopolitan or spirit, I should, I should indicate why there's one word left out from the title, which is very crucial to this place, and that is the word civilization. And if you read the book in the introduction, um, the overview, I also ask the question about cosmopolitan. Can there be cosmopolitan? I asked the, the whole book is a series of questions, but the key question for me is, can there be any cosmopolitan that does not have civilizational roots? So the very term cosmopolis, cosmopolis, implies being within a space. And when I talked to Rajiv about why he found the book so attractive, he said, because you deal with civility. And of course, civility is the heart, the key term for civilization. And it's on page Roman numeral 25 in the book, the overview, where I say civility requires belonging to some polis or city, because without that belonging, there could not be the longing the desire to make the world the larger, indeed the largest place of belonging. So there's a sense in which one can't even speak about cosmopolitan or Islamicate or Islamicate cosmopolitan spirit without referring to civilization. And I say this with some humility because within the academic circles of both Europe and North America and also some parts of Asia, <clears throat> including even Istanbul, there's this idea that civilization itself <clears throat> is uh, uh, an orientalist, or if you will, a reductive or <clears throat> a uh, pejorative term, because civilization always implies a ranking. And the uh, idea is that Western civilization or Euro-American civilization or Greco-Roman civilization, all the civilization components outside the Muslim world and outside China and India are reduced because Western civilization is the best. And one of the reasons that I take off my glasses and say this, one of the reasons that I spend so much time with Marshall Hodgson and why he has so influenced my own thinking is he believes that civilization did not start with Arnold Toynbee. For those of you who know a little bit about history, there's Arnold Toynbee, the British historian who wrote, I believe it was 15 volumes on different aspects of civilization. And he did this over 30 years. And so many people think that, and of course the end result of it was to say, the heritage and the end result of all the civilizations of the world is Euro-American or Western civilization. So I am not for a moment suggesting that Toynbee didn't have a bias and that his instrumentality was to make civilization studies a part of a larger Western hegemony in not only politics and economics and society, but also in the academy. But I have argued with people and I've even argued with some of my Muslim colleagues in America and elsewhere the civilization did not start with Toynbee, it started with Ibn Khaldun. I don't need to say that here, but I have to reinforce it here 
because when I talk and um, Michael Kaplan just asked me, do I get nervous when I give talks? And I said, no, not in front of some audiences, but there are other audiences when, if I bring up the term civilization and bring up Ibn Khaldun, who is he? Where did this person come from? Why are you bringing him into the discussion? In other words, in the same way that you take for granted, as you should, that Ibn Khaldun is a great person and everybody who comes here knows about Ibn Khaldun before they enroll, or if they don't, they know about him within the first week of being here. In many other audiences, including some of the advanced academic circles or so-called advanced, so-called academic circles within which I circulate, the name Ibn Khaldun is not familiar. Sometimes it's not known. And if known, it's not understood that there is something called Umran. So I'm very indebted to Rajiv Kumar, not only for organizing this, but for emphasizing that Umran, rather than talking about Islamic or Islamic age civilization, he uses the term Umran. Umran exposes and also projects a notion of what Hodgson calls the ecumene or the civilized world where people talk to each other across boundaries. They also fight with each other. Not every conversation is friendly. They're also, uh, I think there's somebody here who's worked in Munazara. Anyway, there's a whole tradition about, <laughs> there he is, there's Rafmi. So I'm not gonna talk about Munazara today and I don't talk about it in my book, but there is a sense in which uh, even Munazara implies that people are able to listen as well as to argue with one another. Uh, or to put it another way, you can't have a good argument unless there's both a speaker and a listener and each of them understands the value of that conversation. So really in what I'm trying to do in Islamic cosmopolitan spirit is to have a larger spirit, spiritual discussion, but also one with academic resonance about what is the role of Islam in world history. And I take Hodgson as my model because he used this interesting term, the venture of Islam. And it's a real curious word because venture can be just a haphazard exploration or it can be a deep um, resonance of activity that goes beyond your own worldview or your own understanding of life. And so venture of Islam means venture within and venture beyond the usual boundaries of Islam. And when he talks about the subtitle, he talks about conscience and history in a world civilization. So Hodgson is very much aware, first of all, that Islam is part of the world and not apart from the world. That what happened in terms of the development of Islam was not simply something that limited to North Africa or the Levant region or the greater part of, of, of West Asia or South Asia or Southeast Asia. That there's a certain sense in which there's a world history and Islam is a major component. For those of you who don't know Hodgson, he died at an early age and he had not even completed his book on Islam, but he was intending to make this a building block for a larger world history, one that included India and Indic civilization and included Chinese and of course, Japanese and Korean, as well as Chinese notions of civilization. And of course, Africa, which gets left out of many equations, but there are many very rich elements of global civilization that come from Africa and of course, Europe and North America. But if one doesn't start at a position point in the middle, it's hard to work towards either end. And so Hodgson and I follow him, finds that the term Muslim and Islamic are too limiting to talk about what became, in his words, the venture of Islam, or conscience and history in a world civilization. And so one of the things I'm very pleased to share with you today, and I can give this, um, and I'm happy to give this uh, to, to, to, to Rajiv to, to, to copy if he wants, is a review by a former student of mine and also a student of Carl Ernst, whom I should apologize, was going to be here today and we were going to talk about how cosmopolitanism works, but unfortunately his wife became ill and so he had to stay home and stay back in the hotel with her. But one of his students, who was also a student of mine, he teaches at a place called UNC, University of North Carolina, and Miriam and I both teach at a place called Duke, but we're 11 miles apart and so we've had many common students. And one of these common students wrote a review, which will appear on Saturday of my book, where he says, in effect, the term Muslim, while it's helpful, as Muhammad Iqbal said, in Western term, it's become a very static notion of a person who's identified as Muslim 
is rendered to have certain presuppositions and to always be a person of faith and not also a creative and dynamic person in civilization. So Hodgson, who also writes about Iqbal in the third volume of his Venture of Islam, says Muslim and Islamic are not bad terms, but they have become in modern Western terms, limiting and homogenizing, in other words, enclosing or incarcerating, that's, that's, um, that's um, Iqbal's term, an incarcerating effect, which deprives one of understanding the larger ethos of Muslim and Islamic identity. So there's a sense in which the term Islamicate is not to deny or oppose or reject Muslim or Islam or Islamic, but to show a larger, what I call, larger arc of influence that goes beyond a merely religious or creedal or social geographical identity could be linked to Islam. Give an example of what this is. He, when he's writing about this, he says, Intellectual and education, intellect and education, culinary and sartorial habits, scientific advance, social formations, ethical juridical deliberation. All these are contributions which cannot be labeled narrowly as Muslim or Islamic, but are crucial when one thinks of the role of Islam in world civilization. So I could say more, and I would like to say more and maybe in response to questions and answers, but I wanted to give some time to Miriam. Uh, who's worked with me in many ways on all this, to say some things about Barzakh logic, which is part of the key. Would you like to come here, Mir? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> good morning. And uh, it's a pleasure to be back here after being away for two and a half years. Um, so um, Bruce and I um, became uh, acquainted with the notion of Barzakh um, about 17 years ago, a long time ago. Um, and it was while we were working on a book called Muslim Networks from Hajj to Hip Hop. Some people don't like the title because they think that hip hop makes Hajj sound less serious, but um, we make um, hip hop sound serious. <clears throat> and we decided, we, we brought together a number of our friends, um, colleagues, who were working on networks. And of course, in 2005, when our book came out, Muslim Networks was very much connected to 9-11. <clears throat> so when people heard Muslim Networks, they're like, oh my God, these guys are dealing with terrorism. And in fact, what we were interested in was the ways in which um, Muslims, but in fact, people in general, but, but Muslims for the purpose of our book, have been always connected from before um, Muhammad. And um, as Bruce and Marshall Hodgson have, um, have said, it, there was Islam before Islam. <clears throat> so that's Marshall Hodgson's idea that, that there was um, the conditions for the emergence of this specific religion were already, were already there. So how did it spread? It spread because there were these networks, there were um, these pathways between nodes that had existed from the time of Dilmun. So from the time of, of Bahrain, 6,000 years ago when, when Dilmun, the Bahrain empire was rich. And rich because of pearls. And that is something I'm, I want to get back to in a minute. So um, we invited Taya Bilghazi, an extraordinary Moroccan uh, scholar who teaches at Mohammed al khamis in uh, Rabat. We asked him to write the, the postface, the, the postscript. And uh, he was like, oh my God, you guys, you're, you're dealing with Barzakh. 
you know, it's all about Barzakh. And we're like, oh, what's Barzakh? This was around 2002. And uh, he said, oh, you know, uh, this is Ibn Arabi's term. And around this time, very, very few people, except for Ibn Arabi scholars, were dealing with Barzakh. So he wrote this wonderful postscript that I think brought together the book in a better way than Bruce and I did with our introduction. Um, but it's kind of like tying, you know, the bow on a present. And um, it, was, it was from that time that both of us in very different ways have moved with this notion. Bruce calls it Barzakh logic, I call it Barzakh epistemology. And we could answer questions of what, um, is, it, is there a difference? Maybe there's not a difference. Um, it seems to me that for me, it, it's the way we know the world. And um, so what was interesting um, around that time, it was a zeitgeist. It has to have been because it wasn't just because we were writing about it or Talia Bilhazi was writing about it. But for those of you who are interested in critical theory, you may have noticed just how many people are beginning to uh, think about work and um, ideas, peoples, civilizations coming together in a way that needs to be thought through the Barzakh. So what does that mean? It means that when differences come together, so Bruce in his book, um, Islamic cosmopolitan spirit is very interested in the way in which civilizations bump up against each other and do not dilute in the meeting, but in fact are productive. And in a book that I published um, almost 10 years ago on Gulf, um, the Arabian Gulf culture, I did the, um, I looked at um, a phenomenon that I was um, very struck by when, when we spent six months in Qatar in 2010, and that was modern and tribal. And so here's a radical difference, right? You have the, the idea of the modern and the idea of the modern being somehow Western, and then you have the tribal and the idea of the tribal as being primitive. And so what I observed while I was there was this extraordinary coming together of what looked like opposites. So is travel modern oxymoron? It's like some people say Islamic feminism. There you go. There's another um, apparent oxymoron. But that in the coming together, something happens. It's not diluting. And that is, is absolutely critical. Uh, it's not diluting, but it is something that happens in that space of meeting where the two elements that come together retain their specificity, but also don't have it. It's like in the Quran, right? The space between uh, life and death, the barzakh, where life and death are both there, but neither is there. Again, from the Quran, where the, where the sweet and the salt waters come together in the barzakh, they're both there, but neither is there. And what is so productive about barzakh thinking, so we could, that could be both logic and epistemology, what is so productive is that in that strange place of contradictions that are not to be resolved, and people who have responded to um, Bruce's book are like, well, you know, it's sort of um, Hegel, um, it's um, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Okay, great. So we, we have synthesis. No, synthesis closes out the epistemological possibilities of what happens in contradictions, leaves it always open. 
And so it allows you to keep thinking because once you've got a synthesis, it stops thought. So that's what's interesting in, in, for us. Now, I want to go back to the, the question of the Dilmun Empire and their pearls. So their pearls were um, found, the divers dived for pearls that were so, so precious that they created an empire. And, it, and Ibn Arabi talks about those pearls in his uh, Fusus al-Hikam. He talks about the, that it is because precisely as we read in the Quran, the place where sweet and salt waters are both there and not there. And we can't resolve the contradiction. So what is that? The waters around Bahrain are very specific. And for those, who's been, who's been to the Gulf? Khalij? No one? Okay, then you haven't seen something amazing. You haven't seen camels walk into the Gulf up to their knees, put their heads deep down into salt water and drink. You haven't heard then about the pearl divers who would go out on boats for weeks without water because they didn't need the water. They would have goat skins. They would dive down. They used to diving down. Some of them can stay underwater for three minutes. And they'd fill the goat skin with fresh water. Now, where does fresh water come from? It comes from the center of the Arabian Peninsula through aquifers, fossil aquifers. The water comes out pure, sweet. And because salt water is lighter than sweet water, it, it is floating above. So the reason I wanted just to spend a minute on this is that this space of contradiction that can never be resolved is a richly productive space. And what <clears throat> the waters around Bahrain did was to produce these pearls that produced an empire. So we can't say as um, Bill Chittick, for those of you who um, are interested in Ibn Arabi and in Western interpretations of Ibn Arabi, um, I'm less enchanted with those interpretations. Um, so Bill Chittick's way of thinking about or talking about Ibn Arabi is everything is a barzakh. No, everything is not a barzakh. Because if you do that, then it, it's lost its meaning. And for me, what is specific about that space, the unresolvable space of contradiction, is that it's richly productive. If everything is a barzakh, it's not productive. And um, I think in closing, for those of you who know anything about physics, which I don't, um, but I think of the Barzakh as like entropy. It's where differences are so intensely bumping up against each other, but are held. If it goes a little further, it would explode like a pressure cooker. But they're held together like this because if not, everything would dissolve into chaos. So I think that's all that I was going to say. So I, I just want to say a few things to uh, conclude what Miriam said, but to relate it to the book that you've looked at or some of you have seen. One of the things that is true is this Barzakh logic 
pervades not only the conception of the book and the way I try to understand the nature of Islamic age civilization, but it, it pervades the way in which I talk about certain major persons whom I describe as exemplars. And I think one of the things that's most striking to me about the, some of the responses and including this future review is how many people are remarking that it's not simply something that's limited to um, the Arab world or even the early structures of the Irano Persian world, Arab Iranic Persia world that Hodgson describes, but it's also true of across North Africa and Sub Saharan Africa, but also parts of Asia, South Asia, and Southeast Asia. So, one of the things that the reviewer has found most interesting is that if one thinks about Islamic age civilization, and one looks only from the center, to use Miriam's notion of the Barzakh logic, thinks of only the center going out and the center influencing and changing everything about it, one misses the point of accent in the Indian Ocean, which goes from India all the way out to, to Indonesia, is, and of course includes the Southern Philippines, as well as Malaysia uh, and different parts of East Asia, there's a sense in which Islamic age civilization is as vibrant in the Indian Ocean as it is in the Nile to Oxus or the Levant region that is the center part, centerpiece. So what often happens to both Miriam and me and others who talk about Islam and Muslim is the first reflex is, oh, so this is how Arabs became important. And the, there's a tendency not only to reduce Islam and Muslim to religion, but to reduce it as Arabs as the carriers or the major components of religion. And occasionally I'm mentioning Persian, but thinking of Persian as only limited to Iran. So there's a double exclusion. And this is the last thing I want to emphasize. Not only am I writing positively about civilization as something that puts Islam in the center of world history and is best known as Islamic age civilization, but I'm also saying that neither Arab nor Persian dominate as ethnic or religious or linguistic categories. So the other word I use frequently in this book, which also comes from Marshall Hodgson, is the word Persianate. So just as Islamicate does not reduce or eliminate Muslim or Islamic, but expands it in new domains. So Persianate means not simply using Persian as if you are reinforcing it on as if Iran has always been a stable, fixed geographic entity and everything Persian is Iranian and everything Iranian is Persian. But there's also Persianate, and I don't need to explain this to Rajiv, but even he must find some people in India amazed when you say Persian is as much an Indian as it is an Iranian language. So the, for instance, in the 17th, 18th centuries, I talk about this a little bit in my book, in the 17th, 18th centuries, there was more Persian literature produced in South Asia than in present day Iran. So it's an irony of history that Persian or Persianate, the extension of a Persian uh, element that's both linguistic, but also I want to argue ethical. And this is the last thing I want to say before I open up the questions, is I not only make an argument about geography and history and terminology, but I also want to make an argument about ethics. And the key word I use here, which I don't need to explain to a Turkish audience, but I can tell you every other audience is stumped by the word adab or edeb in Turkish. But I say, if you want to illustrate why there is something thing as an ethos and why when Hodgson talks about his conscience and history in a world civilization, the conscience part of that is partially linked to akhlaq and ahsan, but it's mostly represented by this term adab which is not limited to literature and not limited to philosophical discourse, but also to everyday activities. So for instance, Irfan Ahmad, whom I've not met except uh, thanks to the Ibn Khaldun University graduation the other day where I saw him for the first time, when he writes about uh, critique, religion as critique, the term he uses, and he talks about it a lot in that book is adab, as is practiced by everyday people, even people who are illiterate. So adab is not something that is limited to the courtly or elite or privileged classes. It's also something that infuses society. 
So this notion that I want to leave you with that is the larger purpose of talking about Islamic hate and cosmopolitan and linking it to spirit and using Barzakh logic is the furthest reach of it is not a conversion, as it were, of the whole world to Islam so that everybody becomes a devout Muslim, but that everybody who studies history understands that at the core of world history are many civilization influences, but Islam or Islamic hate civilization is indispensable for the whole long stretch of civilizational history from the ninth century to the 21st. So with that, I'll open it to questions. Thank you very much, Professor, for a wonderful um, uh, your explanation about uh, Barzakh, uh, Professor Maryam also, because this has been a puzzle for me, not because uh, uh, I was not understanding, but I have been asked so many, so much time here in this institute, what is Barzakh? What is Barzakh logic that you are talking about? And uh, uh, this Barzakh logic, uh, which has really um, attracted my attention, you know, uh, throughout my four years of my academic career here in Istanbul. And I engaged myself with the Barzakh logic um, and talking as a Barzakh exemplar. Hmm. So I, I worked on Kabir and uh, Kabir as a Barzakh exemplar. And um, you have been very wonderfully like explained, even uh, Emma Hussein, you, whom you are talking about, ICS. So you asked me one question, like, you know, who is your favorite ICS? But I said, one of, one of them, you, you are the, uh, you asked me, tell me two of ICS, which you found very interesting. But I, I, I didn't mention it because it was not mentioned in this book, but I said, you are also one of the ICS. But who is Allah, the, the book I want really to talk about, and because Barzakh logic, in that book you are talking, Barzakh logic is those who invokes Allah for, dwells in Barzakh. So if you in, invokes Allah, you also dwells in Barzakh, Barzakh logic, or, uh, or uh, you are the ICS, one of the ICS. So the, that's what uh, was uh, most attractive for me, like, you know, to, to work on Barzakh logic, because Invoking Allah is very important in uh, uh, Barzakh. Uh, and to connect the, uh, you know, it talks about at two levels. One is barrier and another is bridge. Without barrier, we cannot understand the uh, bridge. So uh, that's why uh, to understand the bridge, uh, to communicate, we need to also understand the barrier, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, differences. So I will uh, open this, uh, I ask this, uh, our audience uh, who are tuned with this uh, seminar, uh, physically and virtually. So the, uh, those who are tuned with this seminar uh, virtually, they can write in the chat box or they can raise hands. And those who are appear here, they can ask questions, Professor. So welcome. Let me just say that on, on the question of um, Barzakh Laji and uh, Allah. Um, I've written about a, a book called Who is Allah, where I go through the different ways in which Allah is invoked and displayed and um, extended in the whole range of the Muslim world and, and Islamic hate civilization. But one of the things that um, <clears throat> I mentioned, and I think I told you that I, I have a very strong attachment to India and above all to a place called Aligarh, Aligarh Muslim University, where I taught for two years um, back in the 1970s. And when I, when I went back there, and many people would greet me, used to greet me by the name of Khuda Hafiz. But now I went back two years ago and they said, Allah Hafiz, Allah Hafiz. And I said, what is this, this Allah Hafiz? And they said, oh, well, because Khuda is not the same as Allah. I said, mashallah, <laughs> really? Khuda? And of course, in a larger scheme of things, again, using Barzakh logic, there cannot be this, the sameness of Allah and Khuda because of the cultural baggage that each carries with him. But there also can't be the complete separation. So there is, but, but in the minds of many, too many people who I would gently label as 
Salafi, not extremists or violent, but Salafi Muslims in outlook, Allah cannot be translated in any other word, including Khuda, so that you cannot have another name, even in even in a Persian culture, you cannot say Khuda Hafiz, you have to say Allah Hafiz. And some of my most devout oligarch friends say, we really disagree. And one of the people was the rector of the university when someone challenged him and said, but you always say, you know, Bismillah, you never say Allah Hafiz. And he said, because when I say my prayers, the Salat, I always use the word Allah. But when I say my private prayers, I say Khuda. So you can have the two in conversation without excluding Allah or Khuda. But the idea that Allah alone pervades can become an idolatry of language instead of, of recognition of the one beyond language. Yes. You can use my. Oh. Well, that's so interesting. I never heard that before. But it, but but but but but philosophically and theologically, it makes sense. So let's hope it's linguistically true. But thank you for that example. I, I remember you from before. What is your good name? Najin. You, you were a student in one of my classes here, right? But you weren't a Dalibal. You didn't have a beard then. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to see you again. Thank you for the comment. There's one question online. Maybe we sure. Can, I think it's for. Uh, I think maybe Professor Mariam could use use so this you want to language, use but you want to use this phone. The question is: uh, Barzakh logic is regarded as the unresolvable space of contradiction. Is a richly productive space. What does it mean by richly productive, Professor? So maybe you could just further explain that. Here, you, you, you I and think I that was your, your language, right? Yeah. You want to shift, shift, you know, uh, shift Maybe places. up here, yeah, yeah. Maybe so they can see. Thank you. Who, um, what's the name of the person? I think it was Roslyn. Is that right? Roslyn? Hi. Yes, we have her. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Yeah. Um, Hi, yeah, thanks for the question. So <clears throat> I could go back immediately to what I just said, and I'm going to need tea because I had a cookie and <clears throat> it was too dry. So I could just repeat what I, what I said about um, the waters around Bahrain where I think there are only a few other places in the world where water comes together like that. Because in most places, water, be it becomes, um, there's a special term, you know, um, when they just kind of melt, melt into each, no, it's where, where water is slightly salty. This is not the case for, uh, for water barza. So as I said, what was richly productive were the pearls, the pearls that were so valuable that they created an empire 6,000 years ago. Um, for me, the, um, the richly productive is to think about um, the culture in the Gulf. And for many people, it's like, oh, they don't have a culture of their own. You know, they're just trying to be Western and then, you have the star architect, you know, star architects. So the star architect um, lagoon um, that looks a little, I guess, like Chicago. So it's very 
easy to say, well, you know, on the weekend they're primitive because they go off into the desert and they are acting like their grandparents. Um, they're now beginning to, um, well, it's been actually for about 12 years, they have had this song contest. Um, so Sha'ir al Malyun, the um, million dollar poet. And for to participate in, in that, you have to use the language of the Arabian Peninsula that their great grandparents used. So this going back and, and tribal being something that is um, class oriented. You can't say that you're tribal unless you can say which al you're from. So if you know Arabic, ahl is family, ahl al um, But ahl is, is also al. So people who, um, whose name were, for example, Uthman, right, with a, with a hyphen, a dash, they now, and a small a, now it's a capital A and there's no dash. And it means that you are of the family, of the tribe, of whatever. And it's hugely hierarchized. So, so what's richly productive about that, Rosalyn? <laughs> uh, what's productive about it is that this is a new identity that is so easy to reduce to either one, copying the West, or being unable to successfully copy the West, and therefore you have to fall back on, onto the tribal. But what happens if it's together? And a term I like to use for those of you who, um, uh, like Rahmi, um, more maybe into critical theory, it's like métissage. You, métissage, it's a French term, it means braiding. And this in, emerged out of post-colonial um, theor theorizing. It's where um, the identity of the, the colonized and the pre-colonial identity are braided together. Now, when you braid, the braid is made up of parts that are separate, but together. And so um, in terms of identity, this would be an example. Um, richly productive, um, I'm giving a talk this afternoon on a, a book called Kitab al-Wajd with Tawajud, where I'm looking at wajd, so ecstasy, as being the barzakh between Tawajud and wujud, a space that can never be spoken about, a space that is um, the mirrors between Tawajud and wujud. So what's richly productive about that? It's the kind of literature that can only be produced in the state of Tawajud. In other words, in the space of indication toward ecstasy. And of course, Wujud never attainable. Fana in Wajd, but Wujud un unattainable because that's that's Khuda, that's God. Thank you. To answer your question, well, since Miriam gave that uh, wonderful example from literature, let me just say that I also am giving a talk in the same gathering where Miriam and I are, are present this afternoon, <laughs> but I'm going to focus on architecture. So without getting too much into the weeds, that is the deep detail of what I'm going to say this afternoon. I use the concept of Barzakh, Barzakh logic, thinking, epistemology, to explain how Nadav Adelan, who is a major Iranian-American architect, he teaches at MIT uh, and Harvard, uh, and has been renowned for many different kinds of uh, buildings that he's produced. But he's now got one in Khoi, he's got a project in Khoi, Iran, to do the mausoleum of Shamsi Tabriz. And I must 
tell you before I met Nanda Vardalan, I did not know that Shamsi Tabriz were buried in Hoi. And I will just say as parenthesis, it's not entirely clear according to history that that is where Shamsi Tabriz is buried. But for people in Iran, especially in Hoi, that is the place. Shamsi Tabriz is buried in this particular graveyard and they've done a testing of the soil and it does go back to 13th century. So they're pretty clear that it's somebody very ancient who's buried there and they're pretty sure, or they want to believe, and they have believed, and they now want to commemorate the place as a mausoleum of Shamsi Tabriz. So when I was talking with him about the nature of this project, I mentioned Barzakh. He said, Barzakh, that's like the super ellipse. And I must tell you, this is very new. If new to you, it's new to me. I never thought of Barzakh in concrete. I thought in terms of water, as Miriam has talked about it, I thought about it in terms of different aspects of behavior and thinking, but I never thought of it in terms of architecture. He said, oh no, this is like Piet Hein. And then he mentions this Danish mathematician philosopher named Piet Hein, who had a notion of the super ellipse. And I don't have a picture in front of you, but I can do it without a picture. So you have a circle like this and you have a square like this. And you have a super ellipse, which has elements of both a square and a circle. It's neither a square nor a circle. It's in some sense, both a square and a circle, but it's also beyond a square and a circle. So he says the super ellipse for me is now clearly an example of Barzakh logic. And I submit to you that only in thinking about Shamsi Tabriz and his relation to the Malana could we come up with an architectural equivalent of Barzakh. So thank you for that. Thank you for that question. Related to what? To, to, to, to dreams. Yeah, so it's a very, you want to say more about that? About bars off his dreams? So if you're talking about Tachayul, right. So um, that's obviously Ibn Arabi's um, term that the Barzakh, the Barzakh for him is the mirror and it's a Mohammedan reality and it's imagination and it's dreams. So I critiqued earlier Chittik's notion that, every, that in Ibn Arabi, everything is, is Barzakh, but I think what, what is crucial is to, actually, let's just think about ourselves in the morning. You wake up, you're tired, there's a dream, and then you're waking up, and sometimes you can't make a distinction between what you were just dreaming. Was that something that happened yesterday? Or is it my dream? And so in that space, you're both awake and asleep, but you're not awake and you're not asleep. So it seems to me that this is a way of thinking about tachayul, you know, where it's two radically different states that they're together, braided, again, 
but they become clearly separated when you go, oh, no, I was dreaming that. Does that help? Okay. Emptiness. You know, I think there's a really, in, and I, I can't remember, maybe Bruce or maybe some of you know, um, there is a passage in the Quran that as far as Bruce and I can work out, nobody has been able to translate into English because I think they didn't understand it. Um, so Bruce is um, translating the Quran with um, Rafi Habib, and I've been working on it. So is this passage about, you know, God takes, takes you and then he sends you back and then he takes you and, and it's like, what is this? I mean, is this reincarnation or whatever? And then the more we were reading it, the more we realized that in fact, what is being described is that at the end, when you're Ajal Musamma, when your allotted time on earth comes, God will then take you and may send you back. But in that same set of ayahs, God does that during sleep. So I don't know if any of you are, I don't know if anyone has a Hafiz Quran here, but. Um, we could we could find it because it was like oh my god that's right that's the ultimate barzakh right that god god takes you to himself when you sleep and sends you back into waking the way he she hiwa we think it should be not huwa but not hiya it should be hiwa um, in the way that God um, will do at the end of your life. But there's always this notion that he will send you back out. And so in that state, in that early morning state, you, if you believe in, in God and you believe in the Quran, you are in that state where you both and I think, Rajiv, it goes back to your thing of, you know, do you, every time that you, you call on God, are you in a barzakh? I don't, I would not think so, but I do think that in that moment, you are su suspended, held, maybe, held between God and the reality. Bruce, sorry, can just come up here so then we can both answer. Yeah. Easier this way. Version. Mm -hmm. 
Theoretically. So you're talking about when did it appear sort of theoret theoretically, because obviously it, it's been there and, uh, you know. Well, of course, it's in the Quran. It's in the Quran in three places. And so I think we, we also have to think about context between cultures. And of course, Ibn Khaldun came up with these, um, with the distinction between Ajam and Arab, right? So of course, in the earlier period, if you were Ajam, it just meant you didn't speak Arabic. Um, it then became Iranian, and oh, no, it became Persian. Persian. <laughs> um, and then it became it, it was broader. But I don't know, I would hazard a guess, and I'm curious to know what you think. Um, I would hazard that um, if you are not totally committed to this being God's unmediated word to Muhammad through Gabriel, um, that there, it must have been taken from the Persians as having such a specific meaning that it could not be translated. That would be my, my answer. Yeah. I'm, but also I'm really interested in the, the literary convention. And I think we see this also a lot. And I think in Labid, between the animal and the human. Yeah. yeah. So th there's a, a, a colleague of ours um, named Vincent uh, Cornell, who has written a lot about Ibn Sab'in. And he's a, who preceded Ibn Arabi by about 100 years. He was more like 12th century, Ibn Arabi, 13th century. But he says Ibn Sab'in had speculated on the nature of Barzakh, and many of his writings were something that were seen as heretical when he did it, but it's acceptable when Ibn Arabi did. Although some people would say Ibn Arabi also was a heretic. And the part of this whole notion of speculating about the nature of the Barzakh as in, not only in, in immediate, but an external and internal realm at the same time is something that uh, for many people in Kalam and Falsafa was outside the boundary of acceptable thought. So I think it, it had antecedents before Ibn Arabi, but really became full blown with the Futhat and Makiyah. Yeah, and I, I mean, to go back also to your question, which I see as a more modern question, maybe. Um, so we have Ibn Arabi, according to Chidik, saying, um, you know, everything is a barzakh, which means it has no, no that meaning. has no meaning. You know, if everything is a barzakh, then, <laughs> then it's lost its meaning. So we, I think we have to stick with something that is, um, you know, is it proto-Hegelian, post-Hegelian? It's kind of in that space. Um, but as I was saying, what for me has been so interesting is that somehow there was something in the air, you know, zeitgeist, for those of you who use some German um, words. And the spirit, actually, geist, the spirit of the moment, yeah. um, where somehow Barzakh has entered into post-structuralist language. And, um, but specifically that word, sometimes with, you know, attribution to Ibn Arabi, um, but sometimes not. But I think it's a very recent phenomenon. And I think that at a time that is after Huntington's clash of civilizations. And this institute, which is why we love to be here, um, this institute's and the UN's reaction to Huntington after 2000 and after 9-11 is that these differences that have been so radicalized so binarized um, that there has to be a way to think beyond clash to, to alliance and just a, 
a short point. Um, when Bruce and I were um, in Romania a few years ago, I was teaching in Bucharest. And um, we were very amused that Romanians were extremely angry <laughs> with Huntington. I mean, we were too. But what upset them is that he drew the line through the middle of Romania. So <laughs> Romania is neither in nor out. It's a, it's a Barzakh country. But they didn't like it because they felt it, it, they'd been split apart. So I can't wait for your second question. I never thought of it as you just expressed it, but I would agree immediately that it is a, it is much a term, it's much a tool as it is a product of education. It's a process as well as a product. That adab is not only is it's not only what you say, it's how you how you say. It's the performance as much as the meaning. Yeah. So I thought where you're going to go in the discussion I've often had with people is what is the difference between adab and akhlaq? Mm -hmm. And in my, in my view, akhlaq is much more formalized doctrines or principles of education or good conduct, whereas adab is the spirit of the performance or the activity of good behavior. Yeah, no, that's a very, very nice distinction. Thank you for that. Yes, Munir. Yeah, okay. So this one is more a question about kind of resources. We'll just maybe quickly on, on this one. Um, so, Not being very quick. Okay, uh, as Professor Lawrence has taught the venture of Islam in university classes for 35 years, can I ask the professor if he has any of those courses available for the general public or if he can suggest other authors' lectures or books to better help understand Hodgson's book? So, just a so we request have a, for... we have an hour. <laughs> okay. So, we, we have an hour to explore that question. So, um, I, I would say with all humility that um, Hodgson is both uh, a resource and a disease. He's a resource because he helps you. He's a disease because it's very tough to get through all of the difficult language and uh, arguments that he uses because he's read so much and so thoroughly. So I would say the best way to use the term shoehorn or to gently ease yourself into thinking of Hodge and using his terms is the article which I mentioned in my book, but uh, I've also used when I've taught here uh, in uh, the Alliance, is the, the, the Mukhtasar, the epitome, uh, the consolidation of Hodge in, in, in a long article in Encyclopedia Britannica called The Islamic World. The Islamic World by Marilyn Waldman. You, you know this, Erjaman Hoja, don't you? Yeah. And it, she was his last student. 
Marilyn Wallman was Hodgson's last student and she was a committed teacher. And she also recognized that not everybody could read Hodgson and feel as if they had a good morning coffee. They would sometimes feel they've had something that's too strong or not um, clear enough for them. But Marilyn Waldman has this wonderful thing called the, the Islamic World, which I think is about 50, 55 pages in Encyclopedia Britannica. Um, and I think if, if one just mentioned, if one just, with this wonderful thing called the internet, if one just did Marilyn Waldman, um, the Islamic World, Britannica, it would come up. But if not, Erjama, you probably have the, the time, don't you? You, you, you have that as something, as a resource that you've used. So Erjaman Asad could give. Yeah. And so I, I, I think, uh, yeah. And there also is a, a very interesting um, recent book that came out from the University of Chicago about uh, uh, Islam and world history, the venture of Marshall Hodgson, which, which has some very interesting essays about how you read him in the, in the, in the 21st century. So there, there, there, there, that's a, a new book that came out, I think 2018 from the University of Chicago called Islam and World History. And the subtitle is The Venture, you, picking up on Hodgson's own title. You know this book, don't you, Erjaman? Awesome. Came out in 2018 by, uh, not, not by Burke, uh, but by Mandel and, and uh, Burke. But anyway, I can give you that reference as well uh, to a, a recent monograph. But those are the two things that Waldman, I would say is a benchmark and this more recent monograph um, is a kind of additive to it. Uh, Matisu, can you address your question? You can open your mic. Thank you. Do you hear me, everyone? We can hear you. Yes. Good morning. Good so I have a question to Professor Bruce about the cosmopolitan, uh, cosmopolitan spirit. My question is, according to your book, you have written that cosmopolitanism is provided as trans-territorial and a trans-temporal ethnos, which take a deep root from formation and the reception of Islam as ethical and aesthetic sensibility. So in that sensibility, you have mentioned that sensibility is attached with adab, Arabic word, which means cultural and behavioral ref uh, refinement which permit the network of Islam. So my question is, uh, adab as Arabic word is there to appreciate and to appropriate the major cultural tradition. So which are those cultural traditions that are, are attached with adab in cosmopolitan spirit of Islam? Could you repeat that question? I think quite I at think the end. He's trying to identify cultures that have adab and those that don't. Is that right? I, is that the question? I can't. So, Mate, so are you are you asking whether there are some cultures or civilizations that have adab and others that don't? Yes, to mean because the cosmopolitanism is attached with trans territorial and the trans temporal ethos which are attached also with what he has written in the book, sensibility with the word adab. So I would like to know, adab is allowed with the word, with appreciation and appropriation of the major cultural traditions. So what are those cultural traditions which are attached with adab? What are the- Do you want me to try? Go ahead. I'll just quickly um, respond here because I think that there is a danger of falling into generalization and also of praising some cultures as being muadab and, and some that aren't because beadab 
Okay, yeah. So I think we cannot or should not talk about a civilization or a culture or an ethnicity or a race or a gender as having, co as having adult and others that don't, because then we're back to clash of civilizations. Because in clash of civilization, the ones who don't, according to Huntington, um, those who don't have adab are the Muslims and the Chinese, and those who do are the West. So that kind of thinking, I think, is, is very problematic. Um, adab, clearly, and Bruce will talk about this, but this is the way in which, to go back to the earlier question about tarbiyah, so bringing up children to have a certain notion of beautiful behavior is, is individual. It will work within a cultural context, but you can't talk about the culture as a whole because what do we do with the violent and the evil? So it's, for me, a much more individual. So I would I agree, of course, with what Miriam says. I would add to it that one of the things I stress in the book is that it's impossible to do global history, world history, um, a kind of history of the Anthropocene era, which some people like to use now to talk about Anthropocene stage of world history. It's impossible to do any of these histories without thinking about the empires. And so it's often very derogatory. People say empires are lost institutions. There are things in the past. There's no empire today. Uh, so why do we talk about the Ottoman or the Safavid or the Mughal or indo timurid empires? But actually, the, part of the purpose of my book was to say that history is not teleological. We don't go from empires to post-empires or colonies to post-colonies or nation states to post-nation states. One has to look at civil society. And I think this is the strength of uh, the course that um, Hiba Raouf, Professor Hiba Raouf teaches here on global civil society, that individuals matter, but individuals matter in collective ways and ways in which they interact and benefit from. And of course, sometimes in ways that are not helpful to other human beings, but you have to look at the purposes and the structures of civil society and the individual purposes without condemning or praising the society as a whole. So I think Adab operates in that, if I can use it, the Barzakh realm between the individual and the state or the entity, the political entity. Uh, and it's neither one, but it's also both together in a way that's not, not, that neither can claim. Yes, thank you for that. So in short words, can we say that Do you hear me? Ah. So we, we have to take, um, uh, we have very less time, so we will be taking okay. Okay. questions after that. Thank you. But you can uh, write uh, some, uh, some, some later so we can uh, communicate. So okay. we have a question there. Okay. Yeah, maybe somebody in the room is taking up. I think we'll have to make this the last question. Okay. How is speculation both of relevant to the current current challenges of decolon? Yeah, how is the speculation on Barzakh relevant to the current challenges of decolonizing Islamicate and reviving Sharia as a moral legal global system? opposed to Western modernity. So it, it sounds as if that person has already answered the question. <laughs> is it, you, you, you, you can't have either one of those positions and, and, and invoke Barzakh logic because Barzakh would not claim that pre-modern you know, pre-colonial identity was something absolute that, that characterized all societies or all aspects of society, nor that the Salafi way of excluding everybody who's not uh, a person who worships in, in Arabic and, and acknowledges Arabic as the only Muslim language could ever succeed. 
So both of those positions, empowering the pre-colonial past or looking at the post-colonial Salafi alternative, neither one of those can be Barzakh, they can only be dystopia. Yeah, no, I think. So, should we end it? Um, um, I mean, that, that it's the same question. No, no, no, as the one before. Yeah, so, I mean, we are getting into clashes yeah, of so civilization language, uh, you. which is not um, constructive. So thank you very much, Professor. Uh, we have Professor uh, Waditin and Professor um, Tokai, uh, uh, Elif Tokai, uh, who is from the uh, Istanbul Ilayat faculty. She will be saying some things at the end, or perhaps. So thank you very much for um, highlighting the Barzak logic that uh, was very helpful to to approach uh, you know, society to through, uh, see the world uh, through the Barzak logic or Barzak, um, which is very metaphorical, uh, but yet uh, very beneficial to, uh, to read it, uh, the, the hidden meaning, meaning, which for me, like it's uh, Adab or um, Islam or Irfan or Umran. Yeah. So, uh, all, all nice terms. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, uh, it opens up the scope and spirit uh, of academic um, in in our time and in uh, and also it is uh, beyond time and space actually that's what um, we are not considering whether pre uh, pre modernity or modernity or whether pre colonial or colonial we don't consider in Barzakh when we see through the Barzakh um, but we we have ICS like you know Islamic cosmopolitan spirit that that is very important that always connects and binds and unites uh, the hum humanity is bring people closer but yet keeps them um, uh, alive in their own way. But slowly they are mixing, developing, communicating. Uh, Professor Vahdutin uh, uh, will be saying something at the end. Thank you very much, Professor Jama and Miriam Jama. Umran programlarında Rajivi bir türlü durduramıyoruz. Sağ olsun. E, renk katıyor programlarımıza. E, i̇şin doğrusu biz bu programların burada farklı kurumlarla bir arada yapılmasından memnunuz. Özellikle İstanbul Bilal Fakültesi'nden Elif Hocamızın da katılmasından dolayı teşekkür ediyorum. E, Burus Hocamızın bu kitabını inşallah bu dönem daha yakın müzakere etmek için bence bir program tertip edebiliriz. Kendi öğrencilerimizin de burada öğretim sürecinde olduğu dönemde. Teşekkür ediyorum. Uh, Dr. Tokai, would you like to say something? Thank you very much, uh, Professor, and all of you. Uh, audience even like uh, joining this seminar coming from far away from uh, uh, this place and joining this seminar and making it successful. Thank you very much, Professor. We'll Thank see you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have um, some of you can join Thank us uh, at lunch. Uh, Professor will be. Professor, would you like to? So uh, some of you uh, who want to have a lunch with us. Uh, we have lunch there, um, and some of you may leave. Thank you very much for joining.